Spiritualism has joined the, the, the church so well, we can't even see it as a separate entity. That's because it no longer carries the label spiritualism. Today we call it charismatic Christianity and even Roman Catholicism. Beloved, what we Seventh-day Adventists have is advance warning of the deception that will soon overtake the world. Spreading like wildfire, it's already entered modern Catholicism. Catholic healing and tongue-speaking sessions are nothing new. But for the granddaddy of all spiritualistic apparitions, however, let's leave Benihin for a moment and catch a flight to Portugal. I'm quoting from Encyclopedia Britannica. May 13th, 1917, and each subsequent month until October, three young peasant children, I hope you catch what I'm doing. I'm leaving Benny for now. I want to take a look at what Roman Catholicism is doing and how she too dabbles in the occult, dabbles in spiritualism. These three young peasant children, Lucia dos Santos and her cousins Francisco and Jacinto Marto, reportedly saw a lady who identified herself as the Lady of the Rosary. On October 13th, a crowd, this is Britannica, generally estimated at about 70 thousand gathered at Fatima witnessed a miraculous solar phenomenon immediately after the lady had appeared to the children that great Fatima vision of 1917 when some 70,000 gathered at the behest of Mary to witness the sun spin dance twirl and maneuver across the sky was perhaps the greatest deception in the history of Christianity. Part, no doubt, of what Mrs. White herself predicted in Testimonies to Ministers, page 18, 118. She said, as we near the close of time, there will be greater and still greater external parade of heathen power. Heathen deities will manifest their signal power and will exhibit themselves before the cities of the world. End quote. To get a good feel for how monumental this event really was, I'm going to quote from the late Father Maliki. I shouldn't have said that, but the Bible tells us not to call anybody Father. But I'm going to quote from the former priest Maliki Martin in the Keys of This Blood, this book. Involved as chief actors in the whole Fatima event were three peasant children, a brother and sister, Francisco and Jacinto Marta, nine and seven years old respectively, and their ten-year-old cousin, Lucia dos Santos. The brother and sister were illiterate. Lucia could barely read or write. They spent their days herding their family sheep. These three children claim that on the thirteenth day of each month, Beginning with May 13, 1917, Mary had appeared to them at a particular spot called Coba da Iria in the neighborhood of their sheep pastures, that she told them she had an important message for all the nations and all men and women, and that after coming to see them each 13th day of the coming months, on October 13th, she would, by the power of God, perform a miracle in order to substantiate the authenticity and vital importance of her message. By one means or another, news of the successive appearances spread throughout Portugal, Europe, and the two Americas. Hence, the throng of people gathered at Cova da Iria in Fatima at midday on October 13. Not only the month and day and place were predicted by the children, the exact hour midday was foretold. What happened at that precise hour was a cameraman's dream, something even Cecil B. DeMille could not have fantasized. It had rained torrentially all that night on Friday, October 12th. On the morning of the 13th, the hamlet of Fatima was blanketed in driving rain beneath a cloud-bound sky. Everyone and everything was sodden. The dirt roads were quagmires of mud. There was a good three inches of water at Cova da Iria, where the three children were waiting with their families, surrounded by those thousands of visitors. 
Toward midday, the voice of Lucia, the eldest child, was heard. Look up at the sun. All looked up. The rain suddenly stopped. The heavy veil of clouds broke asunder. The sun appeared. At the sight of that sun, uncontrollable waves of surprise, awe, fear, panic, joy swept through the crowds. The sun they now clearly saw was the same sun John Paul II later saw in August 1981. This was not the unbearably bright midday sun normal in the skies of Portugal and Rome, the sun you cannot stare at without damaging the eyes. This sun was a fast spinning plate of brightly shining silver, a giant pinwheel turning on its own axis, casting off beams of colored lights, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet that tinted faces, clothes, cars, carts, umbrellas, animals, ponds, grass, mountaintop and horizon in all the successive hues of the rainbow. Everyone was able to stare fixedly at this brilliant disc but yet without pain and without being blinded. All were fascinated by the rim of color around the spinning disc of that sun. At first deep red, the rim's color changed successively to all the colors of the rainbow. That was the first part of what the onlookers later described picturesquely as the dance of the sun. It lasted two or three minutes. The second part of the dance started with a cessation of the spinning motion. Now the sun roamed back and forth among the clouds, seeming to tremble and pulsate within itself, appearing and half disappearing behind puffs and strips of cloud, occasionally stopping and spinning again on its own axis and throwing off those brilliant shafts of multicolored light, then resuming its roaming among the clouds. The third part of that exotic dance came when the roaming stopped. That brilliant disc was stationary for a while, trembling, pulsating, rotating on its own axis. Then, without warning, it plunged from its position above the clouds, hurtled in zigzag fashion toward Earth and toward the upturned faces of those tens of thousands. One observer described later how the smiling look of wonder on the faces around him in that crowd changed first into looks of puzzlement, then immediately into white-faced fear, according as that solar disk, ever rotating and pulsating, came closer and closer, appearing bigger and bigger in its reeling descent, the heat increasing as it came nearer and nearer. As this molten mass of light and heat zigzagged downward, cries of anguish and horror, prayers and exclamation rose up. It's the end of the world. We will all die. God forgive me my sins and the like. But in the middle of the downward plunge of that blazing sun, the voices of the three children were heard above the cries of anguish. Pray and pray hard. Everything is going to be all right. But for a time, it did look as if that disc was going to smash into the crowds, crushing and burning all before it. At the peak of these fears and horror, the disc halted, reversed its path, ascended back into the sky. It stopped moving. The spinning ceased. There were no more colors thrown off. The people could no longer look at the midday sun. It had just its usual unbearable noonday glare. The wind started to blow with noticeably greater force. All noticed the rise and the force of the wind. They noticed too that there was no movement whatever in the branches of the trees. 
No sooner was it noted that the leaves and branches were motionless in the middle of strong winds than they noticed again altogether that there was no water on the ground, no mud, all was dry and dusty. Then someone shouted, I'm dry, bone dry. The cry suddenly became universal. Everybody's clothes, a few minutes before heavy and cold from rainwater, were now dry and light and crisp and warm. They looked as though they had just come from the laundry. One still surviving witness recalled in 1989. Before we go any further, let's remember, no matter what lie Roman Catholicism teaches about Mary, whether it be her immaculate conception that was put forth by Pope Pius IX, December 8, 1854, it was accepted as dogma, or her assumption, that is her going bodily into heaven, that was put forth by Pope Pius XII, November 1st, 1950. Notwithstanding the lies they tell you, according to the Bible, Mary is dead. Receiving communication from her is as much necromancy as Benny Hinn receiving communication from Catherine Kuhlman. Writes Mrs. White, quote, but none need be deceived by the lying claims of spiritualism. God has given the world sufficient light to enable them to discover the snare. As already shown, the theory which forms the very foundation of spiritualism is at war with the plainest statements of scripture. The Bible declares that the dead know not anything, that their thoughts have perished, they have no part in anything that is done under the sun. They know nothing of the joys or sorrows of those who were dearest to them on earth. Furthermore, God has expressly forbidden all pretended communication with departed spirits. In the days of the Hebrews, there was a class of people who claimed, as do the spiritualists of today, to hold communication with the dead. But the familiar spirits, as these visitants from other worlds were called, are declared by the Bible to be the spirits of devils. Compare Numbers 25, 1 to 3, Psalm 106, 28, 1 Corinthians 10, 20, Revelation 16, 14. The work of dealing with familiar spirits was pronounced an abomination to the Lord and was solemnly forbidden on the penalty of death. That's Leviticus 19.31 and 20.27. The very name witchcraft is now held in contempt. The claim that men can hold intercourse with evil spirits is regarded as a fable of the dark ages. But spiritualism, which numbers its converts by hundreds of thousands, yea, by millions, which has made its way into scientific circles, which has invaded churches and has found favor in legislative bodies and even in the courts of kings, this Mammoth deception is but a revival in a new disguise of the witchcraft condemned and prohibited of old. That's from this book, The New Illustrated Great Controversy, page 556. Let me just pause here. There's a reason why I've gone through all of this. Because there are people who might doubt Ellen White's legitimacy. But here is one prophecy where she said it would be a threefold union. Protestantism, apostate Protestantism, the Catholic Church, and spiritualism in the last days that would succeed in tampering with the Constitution of the United States. That is as specific as you can get. And many of us have wondered, where is this third power? It has been right under our noses in the ministry of Benny Hinn and others like him who claim to, well, Benny is open about his communion with Catherine Kuhlman. Okay? And the Catholic Church is open about Mary. They say she's not dead. Okay? That she was bodily assumed up into heaven. It's a lie. And when you have 70,000 people gathered because this supposed Mary told them that a miracle would occur that day and then to go have the sun dance for them, you're dealing with devils. 
As for that spectacular light show at Fatima, why not? In tampering with the law of God and presuming to put the pagan Sunday in the place of the Sabbath of the Lord, has not Roman Catholicism set herself up to be manipulated by the very same demons that orchestrated the switch? There's a saying where I come from in Jamaica. You play with puppy, puppy lick your face. It's another way of saying familiarity breeds contempt. It perfectly illustrates the truth of what really happened in Portugal in Fatima. In having so blatantly incorporated so much of sun worship into her worship. Where do you think Sunday comes from? From the obelisk at St. Peter's to the round wafer called the host or Eucharist. Where do you think that comes from? That's part of sun worship that they've incorporated into what we Protestants call communion. What part of Jesus is round? It's not honoring the S-O-N. That's honoring the S-U-N. That's sun worship in Catholicism. And they got what they bargained for. They've tampered with the law of God. They've changed this, the Sabbath to Sunday. Well, when Satan came to romp with them, he gave them a spectacular sun show. You play with puppy, puppy lick your face. They've been playing with the devil himself. Here at Fatima, he came down in 1917 to return the favor and licked some 70,000 faces. Based on the authority of scripture, therefore, we declare that the three children who related the vision definitely hadn't spoken to Mary, no matter what they said. They had spoken to a demon, possibly Satan himself, impersonating Mary. Friend, it's not just Benihin or Roman, of the Roman Catholic faithful. It's the whole world that's going to be fooled, tricked. And this little lady who didn't want the prophetic office, God gave her visions and, and told her, tell the world. It's not my power at work. Millions think that they're basking in the power of the Holy Ghost when it's the power of the devil himself. Inspiration puts it this way. She said, I saw, that's Mrs. White writing, I saw the rapidity with which this delusion was spreading. A train of cars was shown to me going with the speed of lightning. The angel bade me look carefully. I fixed my eyes upon the train. It seemed that the whole world was on board. Then he showed me the conductor, a fair, stately person whom all the passengers looked up to and reverenced. I was perplexed and asked my attending angel who it was. He said, it is Satan. He is the conductor in the form of an angel of light. He has taken the world captive. They are given over to strong delusions to believe a lie that they may be damned. His agent the highest in order next to him is the engineer and others of his agents are employed in different offices as he may need them and they are all going with lightning speed towards perdition. That's early writings, page 263. No, Mrs. White wasn't wrong. While Benihin weaves his magic across our planet under the radar, the cult of Mary thrives. Within some circles of Roman Catholicism, Mary is actually referred to as comediatrix. Can you believe that? Co-mediator. My Bible tells me, 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. To put anybody on par with Jesus is blasphemy. Mary, co-mediatrix. That's the doctrine of devils. Remember what Mrs. White said about spiritualism becoming so entrenched that opposition to it would be considered blasphemy? Trust me, this includes Mariology too. So my doubting friend, who like me, couldn't make sense of Ellen White seeming to predict that witches and Wiccans would join hands with Christians to trample on the rights of conscience. Do her prophecies make sense to you now? Can you see the third power now? I'll conclude this section on spiritualism with a final quote from the great controversy. Quote, 
as spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear, notice the word will, there's no guesswork here. She's telling you what's coming. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. That's from chapter 36 of this book, The Impending Conflict. Every time you read the word will in her writings, that's a prophecy. It's future tense. This will happen. This will happen. This will happen. And this will happen. And this will happen. And, this will happen, and, th and we have it right here in this book. And that's just two sentences. Five times in two sentences you read the word will. She says what God showed her. Every one of them is a prophecy. Pure prophecy. Prophecy about things that must come to pass before Christ returns. Friend, that word will is found 497 times just in the great controversy. Sometimes the word shows up in scripture like Isaiah 42, 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. That's scripture. But most of the time she, when she uses the word will, she's using it on her own initiative to interpret scripture like this one on page 606. As the message of the third angel will be proclaimed. As the time comes for it to be given with greatest power. The Lord will work through. You see that? Will work through humble instruments. Leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified. Rather by the unction of his spirit. Than by the training of literary institutions. Very few men from the seminary are going to be involved in the closing work is what she's saying. The Holy Spirit will raise up and teach whom he wants to teach. And these will carry the work. Listen to this. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal. Declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority. The inroads of spiritualism. The stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power. All will be unmasked before Jesus comes. By these solemn warnings, she said, or she predicted, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. That's what she said is coming. <laughs>